Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Shari Friedberg, and I'm so happy to welcome you to our virtual book and author event. As many of you know, the Women's Philanthropy Program of Book and Authors has been an important part of our programming calendar, and it's also been very near and dear to my heart, as you all know. I'm so happy and grateful, not grateful that COVID is here, but that COVID can stop us from gathering together to share a great read. And Michelle Cameron's book is certainly that. Thank you for joining us this evening. And before I introduce our author, allow me to share with you a little bit about a Federation's work, especially during COVID. Um, during this pandemic, Federation has had to work next to or shoulder to shoulder with our partner agencies to make sure that emergent needs are being addressed quickly. Um, to date, Federation has distributed over 1.3 billion with a million, I'm sorry, million dollars for PPE, economic relief, food for seniors, to, to, um, to uh, supply food pantries for mental health support, and so much more. Federation was truly built for this kind of moment, but none of this could happen without your help. A donation to Federation at this time would be the best way to ensure that your gift goes to help these needs. Um, if you've already made your gift, we thank you very much. And if you haven't made it yet and would like to, you can go to, there will be a website in the chat room. It will be jfnnj.org slash donate. It would be very, we would really appreciate it. And we thank you for that in advance. And now I am honored to introduce Michelle Cameron. Michelle Cameron is the author of various books of historic fiction and poetry. She has written The Fruit of Her Hands, The Story of Shira of Ashkenaz, and In the Shadow of the Globe. Her new book, Beyond the Ghetto Gates, was awarded the silver medal, I'm reading this, in historical fiction by the Independent Book Publishers Awards. She, lives, she lived in Israel for 15 years, including three weeks in a bomb shelter during the Yom Kippur War and served as an officer in the Israeli army teaching Air Force cadets technical English. She is a director of the Writer's Circle, a New Jersey-based organization that offers creative writing programs to children, teens, and adults. Michelle lives in New Jersey with her husband and, her, and has two grown sons of whom she is inordinately proud. And she says that over and over again as every mother is of their children. And we will put her website on online as well. If you would like to get further information from her, it would be great. Um, we would also ask you if you have any questions to put it in the PA area of the of your computer, and we will try to answer them later on. Um, we're going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to ask Michelle some questions. She's going to answer them, and then of course we're going to get some of your questions as well. Um, we always like Michelle. And thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Um, we always like to find out what's behind a writer's mind because it takes a lot to write a book. So first, I want to know how you ever decided or when did you decide that you were going to be a writer? I decided I was going to be a writer when I was probably in fourth grade. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I have always loved writing. Um, I will say that when I was in my teens, I took the um, uh, unprecedented step of sending a poem that I had written that I thought at that point was pretty good, and frankly, it's not bad, to <laughs> none other than the New Yorker magazine, and got a rejection very, very quickly, obviously, from them. Um, and it taught me how much rejection is part of a writer's life. But also at that point in time, my father basically said, you know, you'll never be a writer because you just don't write enough. Um, and he was not wrong at that point. But certainly um, as the years have gone by, I've learned that you really have to sit yourself down pretty much every day in order to become a writer. And so that's, that's what I try to do. So besides being a writer, you've decided, I, I think most of your books are uh, Jewish historical fiction. And how did you specifically fit, fit that? And how much harder is it 
to write a, a, um, a historical fiction rather than a regular fiction book. Okay, so I actually didn't start out intending to write Jewish historical fiction. My first book is, is a verse novel about um, the, uh, In the Shadow of the Globe is a verse novel, meaning you start at the beginning and you read all of the poems and, and, a, and a, a narrative emerges. Um, and it's about William Shakespeare and the Globe Theater. And at that point in time, you know, because I never mentioned Shylock, you know, there's no Jewish content to it at all. Um, <laughs> It was after I had finished that project and was looking for the next book that I discovered something my mother had always said was really true, which was that we could trace our family roots back to the Middle Ages. And I have a very famous, well, somewhat famous, famous in Jewish circles, um, a rabbi ancestor who lived during the 13th century. Um, and that ended up becoming the fruit of her hands, which is when I really embarked on Jewish historical fiction. In terms of, um, you know, I, I really understood at that point that that was my story. Um, first of all, it was a family story, which really made it my story. But that, you know, it made a lot more sense to me to be writing about my background, my people, and all of that. Um, when it came to um, Be Beyond the Ghetto Gates, what had happened was that the Fruit of Her Hands really chronicles the rise of anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages. And while it's also a family saga to some extent and has a lot of lighter moments, um, there's also um, book burning, um, blood libel, torture, there were moments that it was very hard to write this book. So in uh, Beyond the Ghetto Gates, what I was looking to do was to find that very rare, joyous moment in Jewish history. And I actually found it in uh, Beyond the Ghetto Gates. Um, this, so where I found it though, is I found it in um, a nonfiction book by the name of Emancipation by Michael Goldfarb. And he chronicled how Napoleon came to um, Ancona, Italy, while he was rampaging, taking his troops all the way through uh, Italy on this military campaign. Um, and when he came to Ancona, he discovered, uh, he encountered for the first time um, the Jewish population that was locked behind the Jewish gates. And in a very symbolic gesture, he sent his Jewish soldiers to dismantle those gates, an act which he would repeat on his way through Italy. He basically opened up all of the ghettos in Italy at that time. Did you know about Ancona before you heard about this in uh, Emancipation? I have never heard of it before. I have not yet been there. Um, What's my um, next? <laughs> yes, well, I want to go very much. Um, but no, and that was um, why I put the book in Ancona was because of that. Um, but, you know, there were a few surprises as I was researching the city. Um, How much did you have to do? How much research did you have to do for oh, this book? It's a lot. I'm writing the sequel right now, um, and it's reminding me, I'm in the research phase, and it's reminding me how much research has to be done to write a book like this. I mean, you can see probably some of the books behind me, that's a very small sample of them. Um, I loved, I go to libraries um, when I can. Um, I go to um, museums when I can. Um, and I love going to, for example, at the Met, they have those gorgeous period rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and I keep wishing that they would open up the velvet rope and let me um, walk in, sit down and live there for a while, but they haven't let me yet. Um, and I study artwork. Um, I try to get a sense of the fashion, a sense of the food. So it's, it's a lot. 
what I do do, however, Shari, is I, um, I limit myself to what I call my intensive research phase. I give myself three months to really just sort of, you know, go down the rabbit hole of research. And the reason I limit myself to three months is because historical novelists love research. We'd stay there forever and never <laughs> write the book. So um, I then will start writing after three months. Um, but I'm basically researching every day anyway, because it's very rare that I'm not hitting something that I simply don't know, you know, what would they have worn? What would um, a wedding meal have been? You know, questions like that come up all the time. So I continue to research through that. But yes, it's a lot of research. So as conditioned you are to the three months, do you, are you also conditioned to set a certain amount of time a day for writing as well? You know, it's funny, when I was writing The Fruit of Her Hands in particular, um, I had young sons and I uh, was working a full-time job. I'm still working a full-time job. It's just more concerned with writing right now. Um, and, um, you know, I was uh, helping my husband get his three advanced degrees so, <laughs> <laughs> at that point. And so it, um, I went to a, a class called Finishing Your Novel. And in it, the woman said, you know, after we were all done, she asked why we weren't finishing and I laid all this out. And she said, well, I have two questions for you. The first one is how much do you want it? And the second is how early can you get up? So for five years, I got up at 4.30 in the morning. Now my sons have grown and, 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 and grown and flown as they say. Um, I'm working where I make my own hours. I don't get up at 4.30 anymore. Good. But, which, yes, is, is lovely. But I will say, I really feel like you do need to devote a certain amount of time every day to your writing. Otherwise, you sort of lose, you lose it. You know, it's, it's, um, it's often, you know, it migrates from the front of your head to the back of your head, if you know what I mean. So I do try to get in at least um, an hour a day, at least, more if I can. Great. Well, you're conditioned. Um, <laughs> do you want to give us a little recap of the, of the book? Absolutely. Good. So, um, so it's 1796 and 97. And as I said, um, a very young Napoleon Bonaparte, he's 26 years old at this point in time. He is busy chasing the Austrians out of Italy um, and basically opens up a second front for the French um, to, to chase them out of Italy. Um, and as I said, one of the things that happened as he was doing that is he discovered the Jews of the ghetto. He had, um, and then he went and he, he opened up all of the, the ghetto gates. In Ancona itself, I wanted to show how the people were affected by this. And I did this basically through two women. One was um, Jewish, her name was Morel, the very young girl um, who wanted more than anything else to help further her family's legacy um, and, and work with her father. And her mother and the city rabbi didn't want her to do this. They wanted her to be a traditional Jewish wife and mother. Um, her mother in particular wanted her to marry someone wealthy enough that that would be her way of contributing to the workshop that her father had. Um, the second woman is uh, Francesca Moratti, a devout Catholic, who is, feels trapped in a marriage to an abusive and eventually a murderous husband. Um, and she's been raised to suspect Jews, to revile Jews. I mean, this is what her society has told her. This is what the priests in, in the cathedral have told her. But then she meets um, one of Napoleon's Jewish soldiers named Daniel. Um, and she starts to question 
those beliefs. So that kind of in a nutshell is, is the plot line. And were there Jewish, were there Jewish soldiers in Napoleon's army? They actually were. Um, and the reason that there were is because during the French Revolution, Jews were granted citizenship for the first time in Europe in millennia, which meant they had all the protections and rights of citizenship, but also all of the duties of citizenship. And that included enlistment in the French army. Um, and they were, I mean, the French at this point in time were, um, you know, embattled from all directions. So, you know, everybody served. Um, was, why was Napoleon so sympathetic to the Jews? It's was such a great question. And the answer I think is that he wasn't. Oh. <laughs> um, I think he wasn't. The thing about Napoleon is that he's this enormous opportunist. And he has this really um, grandiose sense of his own destiny from, you know, a very, you know, it actually, he actually, says during one of the battles, um, and this is taken from his memoirs, that, you know, on the bridge in Lodi, he suddenly got a sense of what he could become. Um, in order to get there, he realized he had to create himself as the hero persona in France. And what he did is he launched some newspapers under his control he was like a master propagandist. And um, the newspapers are mentioned in the novel. Um, and so he was looking for opportunities to show himself as a hero. And I think what happened here is that he, he grabbed this opportunity. You know, he knew the French had given the Jews citizenship in, in France. So this would be in keeping with the philosophy that uh, the Enlightenment had. And um, I think he just saw it as a, a chance to go ahead and show himself again to be a hero. What's interesting is that later on, he becomes a little less sympathetic to the Jews. When he's emperor, his, uh, his basic attitude is we've given you citizenship now we want you to absorb yourself into the rest of the population, which by the way, was the way that a lot of the people who helped the Jews get citizenship in, in during the revolution, that's what they felt would happen. Once the Jews were accepted, they would simply assimilate um, in, in with the rest of, of French um, citizens. And it did happen. And I think that he was not, you know, best pleased by that. Is it true, though, that Napoleon had a Jewish nickname? I thought I had heard that someplace. Mm -hmm. He did indeed have a Jewish nickname, and they gave it to him specifically because he did demolish the ghetto gates. They called him Chelek Tov, which means a good part in Hebrew, or Bonaparte. So uh -huh. it's, a, it's a play on his last name. But yes, they have, that actually also is historically accurate. They gave him this nickname. Did the Jews like him at that time too? Do you oh, know? Yeah, they no, did. They, they did. I mean, again, um, he was doing things like freeing them from the ghetto. They were very supportive of him. Um, for most of his career, the Jews were very supportive of Napoleon because he was helping them in a lot of different ways. So there were battle scenes written in your in your novel and beyond the ghetto gates and how difficult were they to write? I'm waiting for and the absolute, um, you know, inevitable Napoleonic enthusiast to tell me what I got wrong. It will <laughs> happen. It hasn't happened yet. Um, there, it's very interesting. I mean, the the. Um, I, I, again, because I'm researching the sequel and I have, I'm dealing with battle scenes in the sequel as well, you know, just trying to get my arms around them. Um, I'm realizing that 
the little bits of battle scenes that I gave, really, it was one, one major battle scene and then mostly the aftermath, um, was probably enough. Um, <laughs> probably enough. And in this next novel, and you know, um, there, there may be more, but um, yeah, they, they weren't easy to write, you know? And I actually went back to um, a writer that I had read um, when I was growing up, a historical novelist by the name of Georgette Hare, who wrote um, the, she, her book um, on Waterloo was studied in Sanhedrin in, 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 um, in England because it was so accurate. And I'm, I'm reading it and I'm like, this, this is just too much, I can't get into the detail that she puts into the battle scenes. So I think I skimmed the surface. It got the point across though. It did get the point across. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, there's something about Ketubot and yeah. and Kona. So, there is indeed. So I had, when I was doing research, there were, there were two major surprises and discovering that Ancona at this point in time was the world center of ketubah making. Wow. So Jewish marriage certificates. So what the, the artisans um, of Ancona were the first to create these absolutely gorgeous documents. They were the first to illuminate them. And so um, they were, they were, desired all over the world. And they have this very specific form to them, which is called an Oge arch. So it's the curve at the top and then the peak. It's actually taken from Gothic architecture. Looks but what, but what's, what's fascinating about it is that um, I have been with my um, sons and husband, we've, we've taken a few trips. We went to Toronto, we went to Edinburgh, to London, um, and I've gone, you know, myself to the um, New York Public Library, where they'd had exhibits of Judaica. And so I would go over, I would look at the two boats, and I would point and I would say that one came from Ancona. And I was always right. Because, because of the shape? Of, because of the shape. Yeah. Because of the shape. So yeah, so no, this was um, definitely um, a major research gift because what it allowed me to do is it gave Morel, my heroine, a passion. Um, this is what her father was busy making. Her, her grandfather had founded the Ketuba factory. Her father was a talented artist. Her brother was a very promising artist. And she herself wasn't an artist. I played with that idea for like 10 minutes one day <laughs> and decided, no, that shouldn't be her strength. But she's um, a mathematician and um, has great management skills. And that's how she contributes to it. And I should add that I'm so bad at numbers, um, but my son, my oldest son is a mathematician and, you know, and so I just borrowed his passion. Works. It did. We didn't say anything about Christoph. What is Christoph in the, in your book? So Christoph is um, another soldier with, he's actually um, a cavalry man in Napoleon's forces. He's also Daniel's um, our Jewish soldiers' best friend. They grew up together. They apprenticed at a print shop together in Paris when they were nine years old. Um, and they went. They decided to go off to to, to enlist together. Um, and Christoph um, is this very dashing young French lapsed Catholic. Um, because during the French Revolution, they basically, you know, got rid of all religion. Um, but he falls in love with Morel, and she falls in love with him. And the problem is that, again, if you remember what I said earlier, Morel's mother wants her to marry 
a um, wealthy man. And the wealthy man who proposes to her is her best friend's father, which sounds horrible to the 21st century audience. But if you read Regency, not just romances, Regency literature, this happened all the time. Someone who is older, particularly if they didn't have a son and heir, would marry a young bride in hopes that they would get a son and heir. Um, so Morel is faced with this dilemma of does she do what her family wants her to do? Does she do her duty to her family um, and keep her faith and all of that? Or does she run off with Kristoff who very much wants her to do that. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the, um, the romance that sort of energizes the novel. It was easier to write romance, the romance uh, chapters than the war chapters, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'm glad, I'm glad. You put in, um, in the story, The Miracle Portrait of Virgin Mary. I did. Was that fictional or was that real? So that was, in fact, I don't want to say it was real because I don't believe it. Uh, right. Okay. But it happened. And oh, it so this, this is the Madonna that um, the port, the painting that was hanging in the cathedral. And so Francesca Moratti um, was in mass. In, in June of that year, before Napoleon came to Ancona. And she and her daughter, Barbara, were the first to see the portrait, supposedly, turn its head, smile, and then weep. Um, is this real? It was written up in a Vatican recounting of it, which is where I got the characters of Francesca and Barbara also where I got the characters of Father Candelabri and um, uh, Cardinal Ramuzzi. They were all in this recounting. Um, and it didn't just happen in Ancona, but Ancona was the first place it happened. And the citizens took this to mean that Napoleon could not conquer their city. And of course they were wrong. And the amazing thing about this is there was an anecdote. Again, do I think it's real? I don't know whether it was real or not, but it was irresistible. This <laughs> um, where Napoleon was looting the cathedral, which is something he did throughout Italy. I mean, looting was just part of war at this point in time. So he went up to loot the cathedral. Um, his soldiers are bringing out all of these beautiful, you know, um, candlesticks and, and everything else. And he comes across the portrait and he stares it down basically. And then something in it shocks him. And so the story goes, he picked up this gold cloth, he threw it over the portrait and he, that was basically the end of the story. Now, um, again, couldn't resist it. Thought that was an, an amazing story we tried really hard not to say what Napoleon saw in the portrait. And my, re my beta readers, my early readers wouldn't let me get away with that. But um, I did, um, I, I then, everything that follows that is completely invented because the portrait then plays a major role in the story, mm -hmm. but everything there is fictional. So yeah, but it was just such an amazing, um, like I said, the, the, these two things, the two boats and the Madonna were just tremendous gifts. Right, real finds. I have real a question. Finds. Yeah, I have a question from Lisa. She says, this is a feminist novel. Can you talk about that? I can. Okay. Um, and I'm, it's interesting that it's, a, a, it's called a feminist novel. All right, the, the character of Morel, goes into what I call my feisty heroine fun. <laughs> um, 18th century women, for the most part, were passive, obedient. There were exceptions. And I would say the character of Dolce is a natural exception 
to this. But as I'm creating her like that, my early readers again said, no, 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 you, you, she, she needs to have, have more agency. You need to make her more proactive. 21st century readers don't like 18th century passive women. So she evolved. I, I will say I've never revised a novel as much as I've revised this one, never. And so um, Morel was one of the, the people who there were fundamental changes made to her. And I was hoping that I would balance it out, you know, between the, the 18th and the 21st century. But she definitely had her own star that she wanted to follow. And she really didn't necessarily, she certainly didn't want to marry um, her best friend's father. Um, although she at some point said she would do so to, to help her family. Um, and then, you know, again, she fell in love and that changed a whole lot of things for her. So, um, yeah, no, um, it, it, I'm not quite sure I'd go as far as a feminist novel, but it de definitely took um, this character in sort of the feisty heroine you know, um, attitude. Thank you, thank you. I have a, a quote that you had written and I wrote it down and I wanna read it to you and then we can ask a question. The, this is coming from you, Michelle. Okay. Uh, I'm not religious bewilders some readers, but the themes in Jewish history that call to me, particularly the tug of war between assimilation and maintaining religious tradition, the anti the anti-Semitism that touches us all, religious or not, distinctly qualify me to tell these stories. Yeah. And, the, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because it seems that the Jewish characters in this novel have to choose between religious tradition and assimilation. So can you talk about that? Absolutely. And, um, you know, again, I think one of the reasons I was so very much attracted to the uh, period of the French Revolution was because this did plunge the Jews of the period into this dilemma. Do they, uh, how far is too far? You know, the, the French Revolution, as I said earlier, did away with religion in France. Um, and so, and they did some things that really interfered with religious tradition. One of which I actually did not include in the novel um, I ended up having to take out a number, um, I mean, I had to cut back the novel. It was even longer than it is now. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things I took out is um, in during the French Revolution, they had this whole new calendar, which was based on tens. There were 10 days in the week, there were 10 months in the year, et cetera. Um, 10 days in the week meant that the day of rest couldn't fall on the Shabbat. And so the Jews weren't really permitted to observe the Shabbat. The, the Catholics weren't permitted to observe Sunday. Um, so, the, so it wasn't just the Jews that were faced with this dilemma, but the Jews to a large extent really were. Um, and I think it's something that speaks to us as American Jews. I mean, we're getting on to a Christmas. I mean, you know. So with Morel and Christoph wanting to get married, I think this was for me really the, the extreme of um, assimilation because, um, and, and this could only have happened at this period of time, because again, with the French Revolution doing away with religion, all marriages were civil ceremonies. There were no, you know, and before that, one or other of the partners had to convert, and who would do that? It would always be the Jewish partner. But I, you know, this is something that the Jews of this period really wrestled with. Um, and so I have them 
you know, at one point in the novel, um, Morel and, and, and Daniel are talking about um, how much is too much, and we won't know this until later on. But it is, it is a theme that I feel is something that, again, I as an American Jew, a secular American Jew, um, really relate to very strongly. That the assimilation right now and religious tradition is going through the same thing. I think it absolutely. continues absolutely. in the United States. A difficult yeah. Uh, dilemma. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And yet, you know, the other side of the quote you just read is the anti Semitism that is definitely rearing its ugly head here and in Europe. And um, again, I, this is something that I tried to tackle somewhat in the novel in the characters of Francesca and Daniel, does getting to know someone who is, you know, the other, can that, you know, can that do away with prejudice um, that you've imbibed as a child, that, you know, has been spoon fed to you by the people you trust, by your parents, by your priests, by, you know, um, the society around you. Um, and so that was something else that I really was trying to wrestle with in the novel. Okay, you uh, you made Danielle, Daniel and Francesca really contentious relationship. Why did you do that for a little spark? A little spark, but also again, because they were, you know, I think Francesca in particular was trying to find her way through this. She was really a good woman. Um, but she had this husband who was, you know, difficult, who hated Jews, hated Jews with a passion. Um, her daughter had imbibed all of that. And she was, she was torn um, between recognizing that Daniel was just like everybody else, but this is not what she was taught. And so, you know, when the sparks fly between them, I think a lot of that was just two people from opposite sides trying to find a middle ground, maybe. Uh, one quick question. You had characters that were fictional in this, of course, and characters that were historical. Yes. After writing and the book was long, did you get, did you realize at the end which was fictional and which, I mean, did you get confused between the fictional and the historical? Did they get jumbled together? I mean, my hope is, my hope is that they all feel real. Right, correct. You know, um, but yes, there were definitely, I mean, so who was real and who was not? Um, clearly, Napoleon, his family, the staff, all real. Right. But, but what you do as a historical novelist is you superimpose your own feelings about their motivations, their personality, you base it on their actions. Right. But, you know, Napoleon himself is a very fiery character. And I, I feel like he must have been, you know, because of what he did, because of what he accomplished. Um, so you do that. Uh, as I said before, Francesca Marotti, uh, her daughter Barbara, and the two clergy were historical names, I'm gonna call them names, because I had no clue except for, you know, this thing in the church, the right. cathedral, that was, that was as much as I knew about them. So everything else I created, you know, I figured if she had seen the, the, the Virgin Mary turn her head, she had to be devout. That right. was kind of the beginning of her. The two, so, um, David Morpurgo, he's the, who's the man who wants to marry Morel, the very wealthy man, right. and his brother were actually also historical characters. Um, and Napoleon, the, the reason I know they're historical characters is Napoleon put them on the council, the municipal council he founded after he threw the Pope out of controlling Ancona. Before this, the Pope had control. Um, the, when I looked at the Morpurgo family, 
they were a well-established and very wealthy family who had lived for generations in Ancona. So that was what I knew there. Everybody else was my invention. That's good. It's yeah. good. It's a good combination. Without giving anything away, mm -hmm. um, why did you choose to end the novel the way you did? But now I know there's a sequel. So why did you do? Okay. <laughs> so there were there were um, without giving it away. Without um, giving. This so I, I I basically wrote in wrote two endings to the novel that didn't end up ending the novel. And the first one was, um, again, gave it to my early readers, gave it to my agent, and that was basically absolutely not, you cannot end the novel this way. And I said, <laughs> in the next, you cannot end the novel this way. So I did. The second ending that I wanted to come up with I simply didn't have the room to develop it. And so part of that is going to spill over into the sequel. And I tried to like jam it in at the end and it just felt rushed. It felt like I would have needed to go back and rewrite about half of the novel to make it feel natural. And I just, it wasn't gonna happen. So the end of the novel ended up actually being, um, the, the book is dedicated to Alex, my muse. Alex is my younger son. Alex is, um, has always been a born writer. Um, he actually brought me back to writing when I had given up on it for a while. Um, and he was enormously, because he works in publishing, he's a writer himself, he was a huge help. I mean, the book wouldn't have happened, frankly, without his assistance in a lot of ways. But I was saying to him, you know, a brainstorming, and he said, okay, well, there's something you tell your students that you should bring into the end. And that is, you know, what does your character want? And I'm like, oh, light bulb. What does my character want? And that's kind of how we end the novel. But it's open-ended because yes, there will be a sequel. It's a sequel. Yes. Good idea. We have a question from somebody in the audience or wherever they are in their bedrooms or their living rooms. Um, do you have a background in Shakespeare? Did you have that before you wrote Shadow of the Globe? And did you ever visit the Globe Theater? Okay, so yes. Yeah. So um, I, don't have a, I don't have a background per se. I was an English literature major. Um, we have a long-standing um, affection for Shakespeare in my household. In fact, if I can tell a very funny short story, um, we would um, we'd read to the kids at night and we'd read, we'd actually, when they were very young, we'd read little bits and pieces of Shakespeare to them. My husband is, is a theater person, so he's also got that background. And my husband would refer to, to William Shakespeare as my friend, Bill. <laughs> so, um, so we get a phone call in the middle of dinner one night and my husband picks it up and says, you know, blah, 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 Bill, hangs up. And my youngest says, oh, Papa, was that your friend, Bill Shakespeare? No, it wasn't. <laughs> um, when I was first researching, the book that came before In the Shadow of the Globe, because I had three books that I wrote, three novels that I wrote that never saw the light of day, and I'm so devoutly grateful that they did not. <laughs> um, but the, the last of the three was a young adult novel about Shakespeare. I did all this research. My husband and I, this was before the boys took a trip over to London, and we stood at where they had marked off where the Globe Theater was going to be. It was that long ago. In our most recent trip to, to London, um, I did go, we did go to the Globe Theater. We saw As You Like It there. Um, and um, my, my, my kids were very patient with me because I took the book and I'm like holding it up and they're taking pictures and all of that. 
but no, I mean, I think the, 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 it's not a academic background in Shakespeare, but it's a, a, a lifelong love of Shakespeare. Thank you. So we started this conversation that you are uh, work at the, the Writer's Circle. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what is it like to help uh, budding, art, uh, budding writers? It's such a joy. It's such a joy to help budding writers. It's right before we got on, you know, one of my, my I, okay, I teach kids and I teach uh, aspiring novelists. And one of my students just sent me email all excited because this was going to be the cover of her debut novel. Oh. And I'm like, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, you know, um, I've been really, really, um, happy to have helped a number of my students, not just the publication, because it's not, it can't only be about publication, but to help, you know, write their work, improve their work, share their work. It's, it's fabulous. Um, we also teach, um, as I said, we teach kids. The Writer's Circle, um, my business partner actually started the Writer's Circle because she wanted to help her kids um, have a more creative experience than the one they were able to get at school because the teachers are so boxed in. Um, so I teach, um, I teach um, our tweens, I teach our invitation only kids who are younger but are amazing writers and I teach a, a teen class. And every summer we have at Drew University, we have a, um, a teen intensive for three weeks. And these kids just blow your mind. They are just so amazing and so good. And they, they, they love it because they never get to, you know, there might be one or two other kids in school that love to write as much as they do. And suddenly they find their tribe. And it's just, it's wonderful. It's absolutely a joy to be part of it. I'm, I'm so grateful that I found it. How long have you had it? Um, the Writer's Circle itself, um, we celebrated our 10th anniversary in um, this past January. So next month will be 11 years. Um, I joined about a year later after, after Judy founded it. So, um, and she was a one man, one man show until I came along. And at this point we got about, you know, we, we teach about 200 students a session. Wow. You know, and it's not just us. I mean, we have other instructors obviously, but it's, but it's been, again, it's, it's, um, and right now all our classes are virtual. So if anybody is interested, <laughs> Come it would be on. easy to do Zoom, though. It would be an easy to do virtual with this. Yeah, so. no, it's been it's been fine. The, the The summer program was a challenge. We usually take the kids off on a field trip, oh. um, but we we managed to do virtual field trips all around the globe. So we, that worked too. Good. We have another question. Somebody wanted to know how did the work on the covers come about? Because they are beautiful. The artwork. The artwork on the covers, on your book covers. Yes. Okay. So, um, then thank you. Um, I'll start with uh, In the Shadow of the Globe was a friend of mine who was an artist. This was published by a very small publishing house, a um, small literary press. And so um, I got a, an artist friend of mine involved. The Fruit of Her Hands, um, I was published by Simon & Schuster. And it was their artists who, who produced the beautiful cover. The problem that I always have with it is my heroine's hair is not red and she's a redhead on the cover, <laughs> but they were not changing. Um, and that's the problem when you work with a, a mainstream publisher is they basically can dictate to you what your cover is going to be. I was very fortunate to have such a beautiful one. Beyond the Ghetto Gates um, was much more collaborative. Um, I'm published by a what's called a hybrid publisher uh, by the name of She Writes Press. Um, and you invest in your own publication, which is a very different model. Um, 
and but you know part of the the cover design was that we went back and forth and I got to say things like you know she really needs to have her arm leaning against the wall because if it's down by her side it's not showing that she's taking control of her destiny so I got to 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 um to collaborate with them and they did a gorgeous job I think I love that cover it is beautiful. Um, I, is there anything else? Oh, I have one good question for you. Another question anyway. What's your book? What kind of books do you like to read? So I'm always, um, I'm a hugely eclectic reader, um, which, you know, is I think helpful. I don't like horror. I'm, I'm not that big on suspense, although I read some of it. Um, but, you know, give me a good story and, and I'll read it. Obviously, I read a lot of historical fiction um, because that's just my genre. Um, so yeah, so I read a lot of that. And then I also like to go back to the classics. One of the nice things about um, doing the research on this book, I do try to read contemporary fiction. And contemporary fiction in this period is Jane Austen. So I get to go back and reread all of Jane Austen and, you know, that's, that's lovely. Anything else you want to tell us about your book that I did not question you about, or we did not questions that you have anything to add? I mean, the only thing that I think was, a, again, a, a somewhat of a surprise was when I published the book, um, and Sherry, you know this, because, you know, we were talking about me coming in, in um, April, which is when it's the book was in person, live to live, we were supposed live, to do. Live, yes. Second week your book came out, or third week. Yes, yeah. yeah, no, and you were the first person actually to reach out to me, and it was such a thrill. Um, but so the book came out in April. So everything that I had planned in person turned to these Zoom visits. Um, and it, it made me reflect on, you know, the book is about a very different type of social isolation. It's being closed in the ghetto from sundown, you know, um, to sunup the next morning. Um, and it's a, a different type of social isolation. But I think because of our experience, I think we have more empathy for Maybe. this. So, yeah. It also gives you another view of the ghetto life from a yeah. different from a different viewpoint, which is pretty remarkable. And not knowing about Ancona, or I'm sure there were other ghetto stories every place else as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, the ghettos, the ghettos were, Ooh, whoops. I lost you. Shoot. I lost yeah, you. you. lost your Where video. Are you? Sorry. I did lose my video. I don't know what happened working. Josh, I need help. Yeah, Josh. Hi, we can still hear you. Um, we, you probably just switched out of the, the Zoom yeah, application. I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, you know, I did. It, okay. I'm really sorry. I was doing so well here too. I thought I got this back. Could I go back on it or not? We don't see you, but we can still Josh? hear you. We still hear you. Okay. All right. Okay, well, you've seen me already, so you know what who I am. I thank you very much, Michelle. This was wonderful. If there are any other questions, please let me know, and I can always pass it on, or Josh will. I thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your novel. I will tell you that we have some books left still at the Federation. If any didn't, anybody did not get to read this and would like to read it, we have them available called Barbara Joyce, and I think Josh will get his... Um, We'll put that information on the, the Zoom as well. I thank you again, Michelle. It was great to get the backstory and the inside story of everything. It's always wonderful to discuss a book by the, with the author because you learn so much more than what's in the book. So I do thank you. And I thank you all for coming today and staying on the Zoom, even though I messed up and I apologize. And I look forward to seeing you at the next virtual events and happy Hanukkah, everybody. And happy new year and may 2020 be a healthy year and maybe back to semi normal ways and I thank you again and look forward to zooming with you at another time, thank you very much. And thank you Josh and Barbara for helping put this together and of course Michelle, thank you. Thank you, you all.
All right. Happy Hanukkah. Bye, guys.